Again, my name is Omar Harami. I'm joining you from Sabil, Jerusalem. We're glad to host you in another Sabil event. In this special event, we're launching our book, or um, a book that Sabil has been working on in the, for the past over four years, reflecting on the topic of anti-Semitism, studying the topic of anti-Semitism, and through a Palestinian perspective. It has been an extremely exciting and difficult project for Sabine. For me personally, I've been one of the lucky people who have been central in working on this. It got us an opportunity to meet so many wonderful people and to engage in much uh, in beautiful discussions, helpful discussions, eye-opening discussions. We couldn't unfortunately include all of the, um, the discussions in the book, because we were, um, were limited by space and time and energy. I want to thank you all. It would be nice for people who are joining us from different parts of the world to write in the chat where you're joining us from. And I want to thank um, our three wonderful guests, um, Hannah Bentkoski, from Jerusalem, West Jerusalem, who is the director um, of the Jerusalem Center for Jewish-Christian Relations, the Rossing Center, the lead, a leading center um, in Christian-Jewish dialogue um, in Jerusalem and in Israel. It's a pleasure having you with us. And I have to say thank you for Abuna David. Abuna David recently, or I mean a few months ago, introduced me to um, Rabbi um, Guy Alalof, a wonderful rabbi. I have to admit, Rabbi, I don't know if I've mentioned that you're the first Orthodox rabbi that I get to meet on a personal level or to have a conversation. Um, and Father David, this is like one, Father, if you know Father David, always makes amazing connections and interesting things out of the usual. So thank you for um, making my path and the path of uh, Rabbi Guy to, um, to connect. And our wonderful friend, a dedicated person, anybody who's involved in Jerusalem knows Father David Nye, uh, Correct me, Newhouse. Yes, Abuna. I like Abuna, but I don't, I'm not, I don't like him enough to pronounce his name accurate. So I don't know, it's, I have many sins. This is one of my sins. It's a minor sin, I think. Um, so thank you, Abuna, for, um, for Father David, for being who you are, Abuna David. Um, a good friend of everybody who knows you, um, an honest person, a genuine person, and a courageous person who's willing to, um, to open doors and um, to open conversations. Father David has been one of the instrumental people who have helped us with this um, project. Um, so thank you, Abuna. I'm going to read a section from the book, um, uh, from the preface of the book. Um, many of the people, uh, many of our co-founders spoke to me earlier and said, Omar, don't waste the time. We want to listen to the amazing speakers. So I'm not going to speak on it. But um, I'm going just to read a small introduction. Um, I mean, already this book has been a value to the Sabil community. Writing it has helped us to examine how anti-Semitism may arise in ourselves, our organization, and our communities in the context of Palestine and Israel. We recognize the need for internal reflection on the way we speak, act, and write to allow an us and them mentality to infect our work for justice both violates the tenets of our faith and hurts the cause liberation. We offer this book as a first statement, open to revision, of where we stand. We offer it for study and discussion, and we welcome feedback in the form of constructive criticism or other comment. The text was written by a small team over many years. Many people of, from the Christian, Muslim, Jewish, and secular backgrounds took time to read the various drafts and supply academic, theological, and editorial comments. Sabil is grateful to all who helped. They are, of course, not responsible for our conclusions. We do not claim to speak here for our Jewish, Muslim, or secular friends, nor indeed for the entire Christian community. We speak to our Christian brothers and sisters, 
in the first place here in Palestine. Likewise, we speak to, the, to others with respect. We trust that our words will be heard with the same goodwill with which we say them. This book is the first in a series of education tools we are planning to publish to help Sabil and our friends identify where we may be caught up in prejudice or discrimination. We plan similar books on discrimination against Islam and against Christianity in the context of the struggle between Palestine and Israel. We hope that all who read this book will use it not just as an educational resource, but also as a tool for self-reflection and transformation. We invite our local and international partners, as well as the larger community, to examine their rhetoric, action, organizing, and strategy to ensure that the movement for Palestinian liberation is grounded firmly in the values of human rights for all. The book can be found. We already printed it. Here's proof. Um, we've made a number of, uh, um, a little bit over 100 copies. We actually have given most of them out for many of our friends or people, um, specifically for many of our Jewish friends here in Israel and abroad. Provide us with feedback. We're also planning to hold the conference on religious extremism. Some of you have been part of the launching of Sabil document on religious extremism done um, earlier this year. Uh, or late last year, um, and this will take place next year. We're going to announce the dates um, in the near future when, we, um, when the committee decides on them. First, I would like to um, introduce um, my good friend, Rabbi Guy Alalu, who is an Orthodox rabbi, rabbi and a lecturer on the Bible and the Talmud who is also has a strong passion for Christian-Jewish uh, dialogue. Rabbi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. So, good evening, everyone. First, I would like to thank Omar and Sabir for inviting me to be here with you. Second, I want to share with you that today I finished reading Sabir's book on antisemitism for the third time. I think that the first of all, I should say to my dear friends in Sabil, thank you. Thank you for the courage to write about such a sensitive subject in such a complex reality. I think the meaning of the book is twofold. The first concerns the internal, the internal Palestinian discourse. Unfortunately, the Israeli Palestinians conflict has caused some Palestinians to adapt anti Semitic attitudes. I think the book very bravely points this out and uh, completely rejects this approach. This is very important and appreciative, but I want to talk about the second meaning of the book for me, which as an Orthodox Jew is more relevant to me. As an Orthodox rabbi, I see this book as an invitation, an invitation to create a religious dialogue on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I believe we can turn the religious component of the conflict from a problem to a solution. I think that as a Jews, this book presents us with a demand to write similar books against anti-Christianity and Islamophobia. And this is, of course, a very important requirement, which deserves to be taken seriously from us, the rabbis, the Jews, the Israeli people. I think there is one particular striking point in the book, which is even braver than the writing about anti-Semitism, and that is the, descri the description of Zionism. I think that the book makes an effort to describe Zionism in the most accurate way. I would like to read one paragraph of the book uh, about Zionism. I think it's very important, and uh, I will say something about it with your permission. So this is in page, 40, if you want to read with me. Although Zionism is considered by many to be a national liberation movement for Jews, Zionism as proposed by Herzl, and as it came to pass, was also a colonial project we did not recognize Palestinian ownership of the land. I think this is very important things, and this is very, very accurate things, because it was written that Zionism as proposed by Herzl.
know that this is very accurate. Uh, the Zionism of Herzl is indeed a colonialist movement, but not every formula of Zionism has to be like that. We can and should develop a new Zionist concept, which rejects colonialism completely. I think we have to formulate a new Zionist concept, one that treats the Palestinians with full equality. Furthermore, our Zionist concept must internalize that God wants us to live together. Here in the Holy Land, Jews, Christians, Muslims, Israelis, and Palestinians. And this is not a curse, but a blessing. I think we spoke a lot about it, Omar and me, uh, about the option of living together here. When we see each other problems, it, it can be uh, a possibility. Therefore, precisely the brave writing about Zionism helped me understand that the new Zionist concept we have to create together with the Palestinians in partnership. This book gave me hope that it could indeed happen. And for me, the real challenge will be the next book. And I hope it will be the next book about the option to create a new movement, a new movement of the present together that uh, will decide how we can live here together. Um, the courage of writing this, uh, this paper, this book, is not something that we used to, to see here in Israel, uh, around the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I, I want to, to end with something, with a story that happens to me just a few days ago. I told Omar this today, and I will tell you as well. I sent some paragraphs uh, of this book to a Jewish friend of mine, a rabbi, very right-wing person. When he read it, he didn't know who wrote it. And so he asked me, he told me like, that's great, it's very accurate. That's express my feelings just great. Who wrote it? So I told him like, you know, you're not going to believe that, but the people who wrote it are Palestinians. And he just, he indeed, he didn't believe me. I, I have to prove him, to prove him that that is the truth. And I think this is all about, when I, when I read it in the first time, I was very skeptical. I told, I told myself, what can, Palestinian people write about anti-Semitism. They can only see us as an enemy. And when I read it once, twice, and third time, I felt like I could write it by myself. Like that expressed my exact feelings about anti-Semitism. And I think that if it will be translated into Arabic, uh, it can be just a great book uh, that can change the discourse about, uh, uh, about anti-Semitism in the Palestinian society. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rabbi. Um, we appreciate your feedback. We appreciate your um, taking the time to read it three times, to read it carefully, and to help us to be part of the conversation as we engage um, in this topic. We admit, for many people who are aware about the Palestinian context, I grew up in Palestine um, all of my life. I was not exposed to the topic of anti-Semitism um, or even the history um, even the Holocaust was not part of our education system. I got to learn about it a little bit through my, my interest in history. And I believe in the power of education and including, including um, opening up the eyes of everyone through education. Education helps to open the eyes. And if we open the eyes, we open the hearts of people. Um, so the engagement of Jewish friends, regardless of where they stand on the topic of anti-Semitism, is extremely helpful and val valuable for us as Sabir. Um, Hannah, um, 
the floor is yours. Okay. Um, so I would like to thank Omar for the invitation to participate in the panel. I read it only twice, so I feel a bit guilty, but oh, maybe I had to read it again. Um, and to be part of this very distinguished group of speakers, um, reading the booklet in the days leading to up to the Holocaust Remembrance Day and the day itself, when the issue of anti-Semitism is repeatedly mentioned, it was an opportunity to reflect on it again and to examine different perspectives of the issue. A couple of months ago, I received a phone call from a journalist who asked about the desecration of the Protestant cemetery on Mount Zion that took place on the 1st of January, 23. She was looking for a Jewish voice to explain the background for the recent attack. I, of course, strongly condemned the phenomena and explained how at the Rossing Center where I'm working, we are working to combat the horrible phenomena of extremist and violent Jews attacking Christian symbols. But she asked me, but why? Why did they do that? Why do they have, what do they have against the crosses? I don't know if you follow the news from the Holy Land, but there are two young men entered the cemetery and, and desecrated the cemetery and destroyed crosses from over the tombstones. She was a Palestinian Muslim from Gaza. She had no idea. Um, I remember another incident when we had a group of women a few years back, uh, Jewish and Palestinian women from the Galilee, who held joint meetings. And when they came to Jerusalem for a tour, they asked to visit uh, one of the synagogues. And before the visit, the people in charge of the synagogue, they asked the Christian women to put their cross necklaces under the shirt. The Christian women were offended that they had to hide their symbol of their faith. And they were very disappointed by the demand of those people in charge of the synagogue who were definitely not part of the group. They were just you know, part of the synagogue in Jerusalem. It needs to say that I do not agree with the request to remove the cross, to hide the cross, and that it was unnecessary and, and disrespectful. But it clarified to me again, after years of being involved in international interfaith dialogue, that the reality here is different. And just as many Jews don't really understand what the cross means to Christians, the Palestinians have no idea what the cross symbolizes to Jews. Many of them know very little about Jewish Christian history in the West, history that they don't share. Many of them don't know, don't know much about anti-Semitism. Um, and unfortunately, my experience, in my experience, I've landed for many Jews, even today, the cross is not just a symbol of someone's faith, but also a reminder of a painful history. So therefore, when I received the booklet from Oma a few months ago, when we met in a panel discussion in front of the board of the German Association of the Holy Land, I was surprised, but then I was glad to read its content, which I find comprehensive, with honest and genuine try to explain very complicated subject. I'm not, I don't think I would be able to explain so well. And I absolutely agree that the explanations of these very complicated topics um, are done in a very good way, way in the booklet. I highly, highly appreciate Sabil's ecumenical movement to produce document that targeting Palestinian society and explain what antisemitism is. The consequences of antisemitism, the hatred for Jews, and uh, the persecution, the tragics of the Jewish people is also, uh, Palis uh, but also the Palestinian indirectly also suffer from the consequences of the anti-Semitism. And therefore, this knowledge is also relevant for them. Anti-Semitism, the Jews experience in the diaspora, the horrific event of the Holocaust convinced many Jews and the international community that Jews indeed need to have a land and a state. And for us, it was obvious it would be in our homeland, but it also had catastrophic consequences for Palestinians, the Nakba. I understand the bill goes in creating the booklet are not only to on, not only to raise awareness to moral problem with hatred of the other racism, anti-Semitism, but also to help Palestinians struggle, to attempt to refine the definition of statements that are anti-Semitic anti -Semitic in order to allow legitimate criticism of the military constitutional and daily acts of the state of Israel and Israelis, um, and it's necessary. But I'm neither academic scholar nor theologian, and I'm hardly an activist, and I don't want to discuss statement and declaration or definition. I'm not sure I even have a clear idea how to define things, and it really depends on the speaker, the listener, the circumstances, I don't know. I'm an educator. 
We at the Rossing Center focusing on education and dialogue. Our mission is to build the desire and capacity of Israelis and Palestinians to create a truly shared societies for all groups. We see education and dialogue as a tool to promote inclusive, equal and just society for all people and all religions in the land. I think it's not enough to try to define what is antisemitism by using academic definitions or by listening by listing criteria and accordingly examining if a statement is antisemitic or not. It wouldn't help. You need to know and understand who is standing in front of you and why he's using antisemitism sometimes, sometimes justly and sometimes as a shield to avoid criticism. It's important to hear what this concept means to him. For Jews, Israelis and non-Israelis, anti-Semitism is fear. And fear doesn't have a clear definition. Fear is something that is not always logical and it's not, it cannot always be justified. Anti-Semitism is fear, is fear for our life, for our future, for our identity, for our existence. This fear is connected to the past relationship between Christians and Jews since early days of, of the church. It's connected to humiliation, persecution, fear to lose your life, your people, your family, your culture, your history, your faith. It's a collective and personal fear. It, this fear has its background in the theological statement and stereotype that materialized into acts that led to tra tragedies for Jews around the world for centuries. And as fear doesn't have a clear borders or definition, it's hard to convince someone not to be afraid. True, it leaves a lot of room for manipulation, exploitation, unfair and dishonest use of the fears. I witness this fear in my daily educational work when I teach about Christianity, when I talk about Palestinian Christians and about the Nakba. As an educator, I find it important to in rec recognizing each other's fear, fears, pain, suffering with empathy. If you know the person in front of you, if you listen to him and respect his identity, his need, his fears, you open a channel for real conversation. The pain and the fear of Jews and Israelis does not justify the horrible things that were done to Palestinians in the past and in the present. It doesn't reduce our responsibility. It should encourage our responsibility to promote just solution for Palestinians, to end the occupation and the daily violation of human rights in Israel and Palestine. Fighting anti-Semitism has to include fighting against any kind of injustice, violation of human rights, discrimination, Islamophobia, in our common struggle for just and equal society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, last but not least is our friend, Father David. So I'm very happy and honored to be with you. And when I read through, in fact, the different versions of the document, I tried to gather my thoughts this morning and write down five adjectives that I would use to describe this document. And I'm going to share with you briefly these five adjectives. The first adjective has been used already, and I would say it is important. This is an important document. It is important particularly in the light of the tension <clears throat> that is in Christian consciousness, on the one hand, regarding the disastrous results of anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism in our history as Christians, and on the other hand, our growing recognition, and may it grow greater and greater day by day, of the injustice that has been done to the Palestinians and how these two things have been linked together in the, his, in the history of Israel-Palestine over the last 100 years. So again, this document is very important. It is an important contribution thinking both uh, anti-Semitism and Nakba and holding them together. <clears throat> Second adjective is courageous. And of course, it needs to be courageous because this document can be shot down from every side. People do not want this kind of discourse. On the one side, Palestinians might see it as some kind of weakness to admit what Hannah spoke about, <clears throat> that 
Jewish Jews in general and Israelis in particular are human beings with fears and whether irrational or rational, whether explicable or inexplicable, whether legitimate or illegitimate, uh, uh, recognizing this kind of humanity makes the enemy more human. And that is dangerous when we're engaged in a struggle. We want to win. And on the other side, of course, it can be shot down by Jewish Israeli nationalists who do not want to hear any criticism of the way that the state of Israel functions. And again, this goes way beyond the borders of the state of Israel. I am at present in South Africa and exposed to a vast number of Jews who are not able to hear anything about the Palestinian experience because of course that means that we are adopting some kind of critical discourse about the state of Israel about which they know almost nothing but which they have almost idolized as their homeland even though many have never been there and they don't really follow what's going on there. So second adjective, courageous. The third adjective that I would use is creative. And I think here the document is extremely creative in an attempt to find a discourse that is responsible, that is opening up horizons, that is imagining a future and this indeed creative, imagining in a future where there is on the one hand, no anti-Semitism, no racism, no Islamophobia. And on the other hand, and very significantly, there is no occupation, no discrimination and no violence. So yes, a third adjective creative. I would use a fourth adjective and that adjective is prophetic. I think that we realize that this document is coming from the margins, the margins of a land where so many are engaged in the day to day struggle to justify themselves to legitimate what they do, that really we need that prophetic voice that can take some distance put itself into the margin and look at the center and say, what does God want us to do in this situation? Where is the voice of God? We hear the adamant, incessant shouting of a political leadership that does not, I think, enough take into consideration that we need to turn our eyes heavenward and here on this point, I very much resonate with Rabbi Guy, turn our eyes heavenward and recognize that we have a God, a creator, a parent God, who certainly has a better plan for this land than the plans that we have evolved over the years of the struggle. And my fourth, sorry, that was my fourth. So let me repeat them important, courageous, creative, and prophetic. But I'm going to add now a fifth adjective. And here I'm always delighted when Omar says, this is a document that is evolving. Yes, he made copies, he distributed copies, but as we know, anyone who has ever written anything, it's never perfect. So my fifth adjective is going to be complicated. Hannah used that adjective, and I think she meant it positively. Perhaps my use of complicated is calling for further evolution. It is complicated because, as Omar explained, it includes so many voices, so many perspectives, and that is good, and I hope that won't be lost. That kind of complexity is reality. I remember once I gave a lecture that was very organized. I'm of German origin, as you can tell by my name, and it was a real Germanic lecture, point by point. And one of my brother Jesuits who lives in Bethlehem at the end of the lecture put up his hand and he said, David, that was so clear. What a betrayal of reality. So indeed, if it's too simple and too clear, it will betray reality, I agree. 
But I think, Omar, and dear friends at Sabil, that it needs to be a little bit more reader friendly. And so, yes, it is important, it is courageous, it is creative, and it is prophetic. Thank you, Sabil. But thank you, Sabil, also in recognizing that it needs to evolve, perhaps towards a greater lucidity, so that indeed it can become, as Hana underlined, a document that will help us educate. Educate a new generation of those that are willing to engage with one another, defend what needs to be defended, but also recognize the humanity of the other. So thank you very much. Thank you, Abuna. Thank you, Father David. Sabil is a Palestinian Christian organization. I mean, for many people who have um, 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 who have read the book already or going to read the book, we clearly state how Christianity has been um, a main source in promoting anti-Semitism. And in a way, us Palestinian Christians, belonging to the wider Christian community, we hold responsibility for contributing to the anti-Semitism, which has caused lots of suffering um, for our Jewish brothers and sisters around the world. But we are also Palestinians. We are part of this land. Our histories, our roots go deep in this land. And we have suffered in Nakbe, we continue to suffer today. We are in no way, um, even Palestinians who live inside Israel as citizens do not have equal rights. People who live in the West Bank and under occupation in East Jerusalem, we don't enjoy living under military control. We should have the right also to criticize unjust policies. Similarly, we need to also recognize unjust policies or or actions that are committed by our own people and our own governments and our own institutions. We, we do not claim that this is the ultimate um, document. It's far from perfect, but it's a genuine reflection. It's, it mirrors what we are going through as Palestinians or as Sabil specifically and our communities. People who have contributed to this, we, we, we try to in, include many of the voices from our Sabil board, General Assembly, partners, people that we work with on the ground, whether they are from the Muslim, Christian, or Jewish um, backgrounds, people from our Friends of Sabil, even our partner organizations. Everybody got the chance to reflect. And this is where we are. So if we're going to be accused of anti-Semitism or not being accused of anti-Semitism, this is literally where we stand. And we are, we're an open book. It takes a lot of courage. Many people have said, don't do it. It's just going to put you under attack. But we, we are not into the business to get the approval ratings of people or governments or partners. We're, we're a genuine faith-based organization that we're seeking to be better followers of God. That's our theology. That's who we are. And we cannot do it unless we are open and genuinely um, reflect our belief systems and our ideas. And um, we're opening it up for some questions um, to our speakers. First, we have said, uh, we've asked the speakers, you have the opportunity or the right to ask each other questions. Um, I don't know who would like to take, um, um, to take this opportunity between Father David and uh, Hannah and uh, Rabbi um, Guy. But, um, in the meanwhile, by, by the time that you think of the questions, there is a number of questions that, um, that are already in the chat. Um, we have a, one of our friends from South Africa. He says, Rabbi Guy, your proposal to create Zionism is a disturbing, uh, to recreate Zionism is a disturbing thought. I wonder how Palestinians can be invited to this project, at least within its the basic understanding of Zionism. It's an ideology. Um, that has been used to share the land um, of our people. So how can we really combine or, uh, or work on redefining Zionism in a way that is applicable or acceptable for Palestinians? Yes, okay, that's a complicated question, but I will try to answer. Uh, Zionism is not so simple thing uh, when we speak about it as, as a Jews, 
we see Zionism as a very complicated movement. This, it has it had a lot of uh, uh, different approaches, and one approach is the one uh, which uh, uh, which came here to to the state of Israel and and made the state of Israel and found the state of Israel uh, in 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 not in a good way, but I think that we have now reality. We are here. We have nothing to, to, to return. No place will take us. I live here. I was born here. Uh, my, my mother was born here. My grandmother was born here. And we don't know any other reality. And the Palestinians are here as well for generations. So, and, and we are Zionists. The Israelis, most of them, maybe 95% are Zionists in a way, not necessarily in the, in, in the way of Herzl Zionism, not necessarily of, in the way of Ben-Gurion Zionism, but we are Zionists. And for, for me, Zionism is the revival of Israel that we can live by ourselves to be creative. Uh, we can live with no uh, uh, extremism, with no anti-Semitism. But uh, I think that we should create a new movement of, Zionist, of Zionism with the Palestinians, that we can live here together. And as I told you many times, Omar and Father David as well, we have no options. We have only one option and is to live together because no one is going to go away. Uh, not the Israelis and not the Palestinians. So, like Father David said, God wants us to live to get together, and He has a better solution for us. He has a better better plans for us that we do right now. So, the only way we can do it is together. Thank you, um, Rabbi. I mean, it is, it's, it's one of the clear conclusions that when we worked on the book, that regardless on the position of the occupation or, or, the, uh, or what Israel is, does, we do not believe that, uh, um, that this should determine on how we treat anti-Semitism by itself is something that is unacceptable and unethical. So regardless of Zionism, regardless of the actions of the state of Israel, regardless of the occupation, Palestinians and the rest of the world, we need to stand to make a very strong stand against anti-Semitism. And definitely, we do not believe that we need permission for anybody to, um, to grant us to speak against human rights violation against our people. And the reference is human rights and international law. I think it is, um, that is like a very clear conclusion within the work that we do. Um, regardless if the position of Israel on the occupation and so on, if we all clearly see that it is it's our position and, and the position of anti-Semitism is clear hatred of Judaism, the Jewish people, um, um, and that needs to be, um, to be rejected and we need to be strong allies in fighting it. That's, that's very clear in the book and I think with any definition when it comes to anti-Semitism. Um, but Rabbi, when we speak as what advice can you give for people who are very much involved, whether emotionally or, or uh, um, um, due to, to the reality of they live in Palestine, when people are working and um, trying to stand in solidarity with, with their people, with the Palestinian people, um, what is the major advice that you think in a way that we need to um, to take part that you, you're willing to grant for people so that people are not misunderstood from genuine Jews around the world and mainly in Israel that their hatred is not because, uh, because it's anti-Semitic but it is they're critiquing the state of Israel because of certain uh, human rights violations. Yes, I, I, I criticize the state of Israel as well. I can only agree. I think that we should see a difference between Palestinian uh, critical of Israel, which is very important to hear and to listen 
for me, as an Israeli, as one who take part uh, in this occupation, like every Israeli. And for me, as you, as, as you know, it's very important to know, to hear, to hear the suffer, to hear the voices of, of, the, of the suffering Palestinians and, and to change it. I don't know what is the best way to change it right now, but I know we cannot sleep well in the night where it's like that, at the night where it's like in this situation. But I'm not sure it's so easy uh, for Christians around the world to feel exactly like us. Uh, maybe Father David can explain it better than me, but I, I think it's very, very uh, complicated when Christians around the world asking for justice for Palestinians. This is the right thing to do, but sometimes it can be involved with anti-Semitism, which is very dangerous for us. So like, it's, uh, it's very easy to listen to Palestinians, Christians or Muslims. Uh, first, they live the reality, the, 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 the cruel reality in Israel, in Palestine. But I'm not sure it's true for everyone around the world. So they, they have to be much more careful with, uh, with this uh, criticism. And and to to and to no. differ between Zionism and Judaism. And in in the book, actually, we have because that was like a very big part of the book. And while we were working on the book, and in the book, we divided it into different sections. We said that there are some criticism of Israel that can be anti-Semitic, and um, and other criticism could sound like anti-Semitic, but it is not intended to be anti-Semitic. But that's not really helpful. And then we see that there is criticism of Israel that could be borderline and so on and could sound like anti-Semitic. Uh, so just avoid it. We, we just say like, become wiser with the language that we use. Words, words are very important. So we we create. So it's we don't see that this is anti-Semitic and that's not. I mean, there's certain things that are very clear and there's consensus what the, that they are anti-Semitic. We say do not use them. This is unacceptable. And even we say that there are certain things that are borderline. Don't use them because they could be you could be misunderstood or so on. So we help people with different exercises, and we and we ask people to when you're creating or writing something or creating and an, um, 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 doing an activity or writing an article or making a painting or whatever, trying to describe what's happening in Palestine. Use these questions. We created these tools. They're not the best tools, but they're just help to guide people um, doing it. But Father David, what are your advice for Christians in, in, in around the world when they, they feel that they, they, they want to stand in solidarity? That's an important piece of the land. Christians should theoretically stand for people's um, to defend human rights. What are your advice for Christians when they want to speak um, on Palestine? Um, on Palestine? So Omar, I'm going to go back to the same pages of the document that you suggest, which I think are, again, prophetic and creative. And I think they demand a certain discipline from us who are interested in defending the Palestinian people and struggling for the rights of the Palestinian people. Again, not as a Palestinian. I am not a Palestinian. And I would say, again, perhaps with greater insistence on the distinctions being made in the booklet, one, an absolute no to anything that is anti-Semitic. I'm going to tell you a story that happened to me in 1991. The first intifada was raging. Yitzhak Rabin, as Minister of Defense, had told the soldiers, don't shoot Palestinians, break their legs. And I was explaining this with a lot of frustration and anger to a group of American Jesuits. I'm a Jesuit, and so I was sitting in a community of Jesuits in Boston College trying to explain with a lot of rage. And when I had finished, there was an elderly Jesuit who put up his hand and said, you know, what those Jews are doing to the Palestinians is absolutely atrocious. I had not once used the word Jews. I had used the words Israeli government, Israeli army. So my antenna went up. He then continued and said, but you know what really bothers me? The lies they tell about the Germans. 
Now, <laughs> this is blatant anti-Semitism. And again, I think that the booklet helps us understand what anti-Semitism is and really encourages us to study and avoid anything that can be considered anti-Semitic. But the booklet goes beyond that, Omar, and I think that's what you were trying to explain. And that is, it says, let us recognize that Jews, because of an awful history, have certain sensibilities, and let us avoid language that pushes buttons. We might not mean it as anti-Semitic, but it is heard as anti-Semitic. And examples, very helpful examples are given in the book. Again, Omar, I think that's where feedback needs to come from Palestinian readers and from readers overseas to say, okay, yes, this is understandable. We are seeing more clearly, the booklet is helping us see more clearly the humanity of the Jew. And it indeed, ah, let's say it as it needs to be said, for some of us, and particularly for Palestinians, the enemy. But we are called to recognize the humanity of the enemy. And you are saying, and very clearly, you plural, people from Sabila are saying, that kind of language, which we do not mean as anti-Semitic, but which will be understood as anti-Semitic, is not going to be helpful. It will add to the intensity of the aggression and the discussion, but it's not going to move us to a new place. And I think that that's where this document is extremely helpful, okay? S saying, let us recognize the humanity of the one who is occupying us, discriminating against us, stealing our land, killing our relatives, putting our, our brothers and sisters into prison. There is a humanity there, okay? And if we want to change the situation, then recognizing that humanity is not only a political strategy, but part and parcel of who we are as Christians. And so the, book, the booklet, again, is courageous, creative, prophetic. I think it's speaking a language that we do want to uh, diffuse, particularly among those in solidarity with the Palestinian people, and among the Palestinian people who are right there on the front facing an enemy and a relentless enemy. So I hope that that makes it a little clearer in terms of the booklet. Again, I think that the booklet does this very well. Again, I remind you, Omar, my final adjective, complicated, if it could be simplified a little so that we can really come out of reading the booklet with a new way of speaking. Our words create the world in which we live, and we need to take responsibility for those words. I mean, it's usually it's people don't want to have conversations. And Hannah, you do a lot of work with education and people want to do like when people want to talk about things, especially difficult topics. People pick maybe wisely pick topics, maybe like the weather or maybe like general issues that it will be very difficult to get people, you know, leave the meeting room um, disturbed. But sometimes you have to have these difficult conversations. And what is your advice when people are already people are coming or engaging in these conversations? Because this is like the audience that is going to engage in this topic of whether it is I, we don't have a control over the Israeli population. Or, or the Zionist population, or or even the Jewish community. But what we have control is we have access to some of the Palestinian groups. And what is your advice when we're engaging in these discussions, um, um, when, when we engage discussions around difficult topics? Yeah. I would like to say two things. Um, one, I think it's not only, you know, listening to Father David, it's not only that the book um, explain how to avoid and to be very sensitive with anti-Semitism. I think it's, and, and this is very important, again, educational tool, it's explain, as I said, for the first time, and hopefully in the future, in the coming future in Arabic, what is anti-Semitism? So it will be easier for Palestinian to understand. Um, I'm not sure if it always helped to avoid being blamed for, for using anti-Semitism, but at least to understand who's standing in front of them. And I would say even something further, since I have the booklet in my bag and I carry it everywhere because I'm looking for time to read and to write remarks to myself, 
I keep telling people about this book, that this book, this booklet exists, you know, Jews, Israeli Jews, and you cannot imagine what impression it makes just for them to know that Palestinians are interested in anti-Semitism. Um, so it's it's education, it goes both way. It's to educate Palestinians, but it's also to educate Israelis that the Palestinians are interested and it's an issue. And um and and you have to raise the issue. And um again, I think if you lit if you have empathy to to the other and you're ready to talk about difficult topics as anti-Semitism, as Nakba, as tragedies that happen, you know both sides and and to uh, be aware of the results of of your action to the others and how you harm the others by you by your action um and see the human who suffers in front of you um that can make a difference again it wouldn't change policies but but this we are working in education in education and and grassroots level we believe that we build the the basis for what you know then later on would be cut, would help to build a more uh, inclusive and healthier and just society um so talking about these topics and again i, I think that again i think if you even if you have these criteria if even if you have this state statement that you will avoid i cannot guarantee that you will not be blamed for being anti-semite because it's because you're palestinian there's so many things i can say and and you cannot say about israel and there's so many things i can you can say and i cannot say about palestinian that's how it works but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't say them uh but the fact that you insist on being sensitive and respectful and aware of the other i think that makes a huge difference and and the the conversation is, is would be totally different and and I think that's what I really, really appreciate in in the booklet that you produce. So, yeah, you will, you might gonna be still be blamed for being anti-Semitic, but I don't think you should yeah, be afraid I, I, of no. that. No, no, <laughs> you no, shouldn't be afraid of that. I mean, criticism no. has to be heard. Feel, I, I, you should be feeling genuine and honest with yourself that you're you're criticizing the problem and not making uh, inappropriate uh, statements. Um, and, and that's but also that's I want to make sure that it is it's, it's not like we we engage don't think that Sabil I mean that we are like these wonderful angels you know and we it's not like we got really excited and we enjoyed doing this it takes a lot of <laughs> energy it's a lot of um, <laughs> it's not easy to engage to listen to to part of the narrative of your enemy regardless if it's it's a sin by itself anti-semitism it doesn't make it it continues to make it as part of the, the narrative of um, of Zionism of Israel, and it's it wasn't an easy. It wasn't like like something like a, a walk in the uh, in the park or we enjoyed doing it and so on. But that's a reminder that if you want to genuinely listen and you want to genuinely uh, hold yourself accountable to the values that we preach, it takes a lot of energy. It's a, it's an exhausting period. It's not like something that people engage and lovingly. Um, and so please, we are normal people. Uh, and it was a very big challenge for us. And that's why it took us four years. It wasn't also that was something, a genuinely Sabil project. It wasn't like funded or people supported us to do it. It was a completely Sabil um, um, action. And we want to share this journey that we have been part of with other friends um, and other members within the community. So um, we do not expect you to feel like, oh, yes, I want to study this book and so on. Please take take time, read it, reflect on it. Most people don't like it from the first time. Read it again. Um, it helps. That really helped us. I read it over like 20, 30 times myself. And I can remember every conversation we had on something that we have discussed. Um, it is, we made it very clear. Our intention is not we're trying to be avoid being called anti-Semitic. We really do not care um, what people call us. What we care is genuinely what we feel on. We care of be, becoming better people, better neighbors. And that's for Father David. Because I was speaking with the rabbi, with, um, with the rabbi guy, I think maybe it is. It's many people say within our culture that you don't have to be good friends, but you can be better enemies, more ethical enemies. That's why there's rules and laws when that govern wars, warfare, even how you treat other prisoners or what what are acceptable targets and not. 
And what, what is your position, Abuna David? I know it's not the ideal solution, but it is about being better enemies. Um, how can we be better enemies, Palestinians and Zionists? I think. So, Omar, I'm not sure that I like the goal of being better enemies. I prefer that we have the goal of justice and peace in Israel-Palestine. But I do think that it is important to realize that you are doing this process so that you can be a better person, a better Christian and a better Palestinian. Again, Hannah is completely right. If you criticize the occupation, if you criticize the inequality within the state of Israel, if you criticize the abuse of Palestinians of any age and particularly children, the accusation will be that you're being anti-Semitic because there are people who have a vested interest in instrumentalizing anti-Semitism. But I think again, it is important to point out that there is no compromise on the struggle in this battle against anti-Semitism. The document is saying clearly that the fight against anti-Semitism must be part and parcel of the struggle to liberate the Palestinian people and to have an end to occupation and discrimination. It's the same struggle. And I think that that's the statement the booklet is trying to make. I think that the booklet speaks very clearly on that. So again, there is no uh, compromise on what the struggle is in terms of ending the occupation and ending all forms of discrimination in Israel-Palestine. And anyone who says that is anti-Semitic is on the other side of the barrier, okay? I think that you really, the point that you're making, we want to be better warriors in this battle for justice and peace. This is what it's all about. And I think that what Rabbi Guy is saying, again, perhaps the word Zionism in itself is a red flag. It has been so abused and misused that many of us have difficulty hearing the word Zionism and not thinking of occupation, discrimination, and violence. But I think in my discussions with Rabbi Guy, what he is talking about, okay, and you can beat me up if I get you wrong, is really a society in which we live in mutual respect, in respect of one another, knowledge of one another, and we engage in that very same struggle, Omar, that you are defining as what can make us better people. By the way, a good person is not someone who resigns themselves to injustice violence and discrimination. A good person is one who struggles, as we are all trying to struggle, but trying also to listen to the voice of a God who is uh, the creator and the one who has a plan for all of us to listen to that voice and live according to that word. And I think in defense of uh, uh, Rabbi Guy, um, I think it is it's also Palestinian liberation movements also need to revisit their, um, their, their ideologies to see is our liberation only for us or for the whole people. And I think now it's many people, many peoples share the land, um, what we consider holy in one way or another. So I think it, it, it's, it's a healthy uh, measure to revisit Zionism. Doesn't mean that we need to be part of it or to engage with it. And the same thing to revisit Palestinian liberation movements. We don't have to be always together to do um, to be ethical. I think people can um, can work separately and preferably together. But also people can. Um, we shouldn't ignore the presence or the, the real presence of other people, even if they're not physically present with us. Um, but Rabbi, I want to ask you. Um, while reading the book, since you're an authority now in the book, you've read it three times. What things that when while reading it, you said, I wish Sabil included or would be included in the, um, in an updated uh, revision? Okay, it's very, I, I can take it with Father David's uh, talking because it's very similar. Like, I, I think, again, I want to say something about Zionism. 
because it's in the book. And as, as I said, it's very accurate in the book and I liked it. Uh, but Zionism cannot be a red flag. Zionism is a biblical war, uh, as you know better than I. Uh, and when, when we speak about uh, to share the future together with equality, and this is the basic term for us to be together, the equality. So uh, we must have less uh, red flags and more uh, and more prophetic eyes for the future. And I think, like you know, we believe in the same Bible, and uh, and we can find there the same answers to. Uh, how to live together. I believe so. And uh, uh, like, when, when I read the book, and I read about Zionism, I accepted like, I expected to, to see something totally different. Like when I see the, you know, the headline, Zionism, so I thought, okay, now it will come. As they, they make me soft with a lot of, uh, nice treatment to Judaism, but but no, it, it's still like, like you said, and you know, I don't like these words, but like you say, I want to make my enemy uh, much to see the humanity of my enemy. And, you know, I disagree with you, in, in, Omar, in, in that point, because I don't want to be your enemy, I want to be your friend. And uh, I think, you know, it, it doesn't matter what you or I want. It measures what God wants, and God wants us to live together. That's a fact. He puts us together here uh, in this hot day, as you mentioned. So for me, that's the only option. And so honestly, I, I, I think I have no comments like to change something. Maybe to make it uh, a bit simpler, simpler like Father David uh, said, but I think it's Great, everything is there. Uh, as I said, if 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 I wrote it, it would be the same. Thank you, uh, um, Rabbi Guy. Thank you, um, uh, Hannah. Thank you, Father David. Um, this is a beginning. Um, uh, um, this is a big. We, we're beginning a conversation within the Sabil community. We want to learn about anti-Semitism. We want to clarify in our opinion what is anti-Semitic, what is not. And we invite, we want to, we want partners to come and engage us and to challenge us, especially about what they don't like. Um, this is only a beginning phase. We hope to translate this into Arabic. We would have started writing it in Arabic, but that would have made it more difficult for um, many Jews around the world and um, especially inside Israel to engage us in, in this educational tool. So we appreciate everybody being part of who have contributed to this huge project. Um, we're genuine and we're committed to defending human rights, regardless of the identity of any human and regardless of the identity of anybody who's committing these crimes. Um, thank you all for being with us. Um, appreciate your solidarity and your support and your patience, and I hope you'll get a chance to read the book and see you um, in our next event, dear friends. Thank you, friends.